Good morning. First, I would like to thank the invitation by IBDT to chair this table in such an important Congress on the academic and professional scenario, counting with outstanding lectures like we have in this table during this morning in Brazil and late in other countries. On behalf of IBDT, I would like to thank the attendance of Professor Heiner Brockish, João Nogueira, Alison Christians, and Professor Rodrigo Maito, in addition to the moderator, Dr. Renata Emery, who relentless aid in the organization for this table and your attendance during this morning that make things so special for Brazil's community. When I thought about the introduction that would place our panel within an outlook and show truly the importance of it, I thought about Bauman when he thought about this issue related net modernity and when he confirms that technology is one of the ingredients that makes our society liquid net. So the ideas of Bauman, it seems they are very important for the introduction of this panel. First, is the only certainty, it's uncertainty. It's what we are seeing today during these days with so many debates and uncertainties regarding the future of taxation. Second, that this net society has transformed gradually consumers in merchandise. And I think this is the context very important for this issue related to taxation on digital economy. Once the consumers, they have been the big valuable merchandise in these transactions involving big companies. And finally, it is understood that this idea of citizenship, individuals being connected to a certain society and links of participation, this idea has disappeared and then we have the tourists. So citizens became tourists. They no longer have this link with the place they are. And I do believe the idea of tourists is both, it's valid for individuals. Now we have digital nomads, likewise legal entities. Once the background of the erosion of tax bases, it's the idea of tourists and not being inserted on a certain place as a citizen. So if we take into account transformations in so many sectors of our society, it's something that our tax system should reinvent itself and in a way to transform itself, introducing new pillars or reforms. Que a palavra que a OCDE utilizou de pilar é uma palavra importante, porque pilar tem a ver com estrutura, tem a ver com base, com fundamento, e é isso que nós estamos revisitando nesse momento. Por isso que eu acredito que o nosso painel é muito importante, porque com a dinâmica que nós criamos, nós vamos justamente discutir. So, Beck, we will address and question these new pillars. So in the first moment, Professor Reiner will address the issue of pillar one, if it's truly the right path. Later, Professor João Félix will assess pillar two to check if it's truly necessary. Professor Ellison will address pillar three and multiple ways of taxation of digital economy we have today. And finally, Professor Rodrigo Maito will explain the Brazil's outlook within this context we are inserted. So like this, once again, I thank your attendance. And now I pass the floor to Professor Reiner. He's a professor at Maastricht University, the Netherlands. Thank you, Professor Reiner. You have the floor now. <laughs> Obrigado, Alessandro. Uh, 
Good morning, everybody. Good morning, participants. Good morning, friends. Good morning, colleagues. Um, good, uh, my greetings from Maastricht. I'm sitting actually in Frankfurt, but that doesn't matter so much. Um, nowadays, it is not so important where you are. Um, it is important for uh, the, the topic that we are discussing now, where you are making profits. And uh, this issue of allocation of income uh, is a very old uh, issue, was discussed for many years. And uh, the most of the cases we spoke about equity between states or what is the most efficient uh, principle to allocate income to certain state. But when we look back, when the first model convention of the League of Nations was made, were developed in the 20s, in the 1920s, um, it was felt that we needed some general guidelines for the allocation of uh, income. And uh, the fin financial committee of the League of Nations uh, at that time asked the four experts, we know that, or you know that probably, uh, to prepare a report on those questions. And parallelly, uh, some technical experts also worked on uh, the same objective. The re report uh, of the four experts at that time uh, recommended to apply a method on basis of economic allegiance, what is in principle more or less the same. Uh, it is the place where the value is created. Uh, the experts identified the state of residence as the predominant place of economic allegiance. However, the treaty practice did not follow those recommendations. Differently, the Financial Committee of the League of Nations developed a more pragmatic and political approach in order to get to a consensual sol solution. Therefore, it was recognized uh, that the place of sales was of equal, if not of greater importance than the place of residency. The consequence was that we decided to adopt the permanent establishment principle. And uh, with the idea that we can draw a clear line between taxation rights of the market state and the taxing rights of the state of residence. In case of subsidiaries, the arm's length principle was introduced uh, to make profit adjustments possible between related parties in order to uh, meet economic reality. The concept of value creation, however, you know, is a term without any definition. It does not provide any clear guidance. Uh, so the only thing what we can do is to search for an approximation by analyzing business functions in respect of their potential to contribute to the enterprise's profits. In a world of digital transformation, the permanent establishment principle has partially lost its function. Frequently, enterprises do not need a physical presence anymore. And accordingly, the question arises whether there is a need for a new nexus which indicates economic allegiance. Potential indicators could be number of users, composition of the group of users, quantity, quality of data, networking effects, scale economies, effects on marginal costs, value of intellectual property used, number of contracts concluded, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. To illustrate uh, the whole problem, let's uh, take an example. During July and September 2019, Facebook had 2.5 billion users and earned through customer targeted advertisements 17.4 billion US dollars which are mainly subject to tax in the US, the country of residency. The number of users in a market country has currently no impact on the division of taxing rights between states. 
There seems to be a doubtful result since the number of users who are the addressees of advertisements strengthen the bargaining power of Facebook in negotiations with potential advertisers. With other words, the number of users has a certain impact on the profit of Facebook, the amount of which, however, will be very difficult to determine in exact figures. Since 2015, when the BEPS report, uh, Action 1, had been published, uh, the OECD is now working in cooperation with the inclusive framework uh, on a global solution of the problem. We, we speak of the unified approach. Pillar 1 focuses on a new nexus and a new profit allocation rule in order to solve the problem of the non-existing physical presence of digitalized companies. It seems, and that is quite important, that the discussion is finished. We have now more or less generally decided that the market jurisdictions should get here in such cases at a taxation, uh, taxing right. The unified approach wants to cover automated digital services as well as consumer facing businesses. So there will be no ring fencing of the digital economy. In the opposite, also very normal companies will be covered by pillar one. But addressees of the unified approach are only large businesses. There will be some kind of threshold tests. Small and middle-sized companies will therefore still face the traditional permanent establishment principle or the traditional transfer pricing rules. In particular, in case of consumer facing businesses, this will result in a different treatment of taxpayers depending on the size. Now, I believe that this result shows one of the weaknesses of the unified approach. Instead of developing a general allocation rule, we will get specific rules for large companies while the existing rules still apply. In addition, the OECD foresees specific nexus rules for developing economies where a lower nexus standard should apply. And finally, the OECD is considering to introduce some form of digital differentiation in regard of amount A, uh, that is the amount that will be allocated partially to the market jurisdiction that will also lead to further segmentation. In regard of the amount of profit that should be allocated to the market jurisdiction, the unified approach assumes a fictitious relation between the multinational enterprise and the market jurisdiction. This means that the whole process is based on a situation where an MN, a multinational enterprise has a virtual subsidiary in the market jurisdiction. It is, however, a matter of fact that in most cases, multinationals have already a subsidiary in nearly all countries where they are active. The problem with such subsidiaries is that they are charged high fees for services so that the tax base in the market jurisdiction is rather low. It would, however, certainly be much more efficient to develop a new system which disallows the deduction of such fees under certain circumstances. In addition, double counting may happen so that the same profit will be taxed twice by the market jurisdiction. The unified approach suggests solving this by applying the mechanisms to avoid double taxation. However, it will be extremely complex first to clarify whether the same residual profit was taxed twice, and second, to determine the proper tax base allocated to the market jurisdiction, which then should be accepted by the state of residence for the purpose of calculating an exemption or a credit. The unified approach is a, a residual profit, which should afterwards partially be allocated to the market jurisdiction. Already the calculation of this amount A, the residual profit, will be necessarily rather arbitrary. The next step 
the separation of the part that will be taxable in the market jurisdiction will be based on a formula that has nothing to do with any economic reality. And countries interested in getting a tax base allocated should not overestimate the effect. The tax base will be small and may be considered disproportional in relation to the compliance burden of tax authorities as well of taxpayers. Pillar one is an extremely complex system of reallocation of profits. Also, the OECD again and again calls for simplicity. Only think about the tax base determination. We need a segmentation framework, specific loss carry forward rules and adjustments of the financial accounts, which will not be applied consistently in all countries. There are very much simpler methods for allocation of profits. Consequently, also the avoidance of double taxation mechanisms will be extremely complex. The actual paying entities must be identified and even the OECD admits that the application of the credit method would be rather complex. Obviously, the OECD was aware that a mere partial allocation of amount A <coughs> was not sufficient to mirror economic reality. Consequently, pillar one also allocates an amount B to the market jurisdiction. <coughs> What is strange, amount B has nothing to do with a digitalized economy. It is therefore here not the place to be discussed, but aims at the simplification of transfer pricing rules in case of marketing and distribution activities. Well, that is something what we can do, but we don't have to do it in respect of allocation of income. Tax certainty is a crucial issue in respect of all features of pillar one. <coughs> Sorry. Accordingly, it makes sense to dedicate a whole chapter of the blueprint on this issue. But the OECD wants to pull wool over our eyes. All proposals request a comprehensive additional documentation. The blueprint even talks about an amount A coordinating entity within a multinational group. That means all big companies are supposed to have a new department on the coordinating the amount A. That implies a substantial increase of compliance expenditure. Multi, multi, uh, uh, agreements uh, between states, multilateral agreements between states, are a very limited tool for resolving complex. We know this, the experience shows. The establishment of a review panel and a determination panel means nothing else than additional administrative burden on countries involved. I have my doubt whether uh, the most of the countries will be really able to uh, meet all the requirements. Finally, a binding dispute resolution mechanism, which would be the only way to provide true certainty, will not be the result of this process. We should not be surprised no, when we, at the end, will not have this result. When we see already now how much the opinions differ between the states involved. But, and that is a very crucial issue. In my opinion, the whole process should be made conditional on a binding dispute resolution mechanism. If we have no binding dispute resolution mechanism at the end, then we get new, very complex rules without any true legal certainty. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Heiner. Agora nós vamos colocar na tela a nossa enquete que será composta de. That will be formed by two questions in order the participant can vote. 
on the screen you have. Now carrying on with the talks, I pass the floor to Professor John Felix Nogueira, member of the IBFD from Portugal. So he's taking the floor. Thank you. Before anything else, I'd like to thank IBDT via Dr. Schweire and Dr. Slavio Net for the invitation to take part of this event. It's a pleasure to be here with IBDT talking about digital economy. I'll introduce my greetings to the other members of the panel with whom I have the pleasure to share this presentation. Of course, it's curious to discuss the increase of taxation in the eco digital economy in a forum via Zoom, links sent via Outlook, preparation in WhatsApp, discussions in Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. However, don't you worry, nothing. We can consider that. Is there anything else that's not digitalized? Yes, I would say. How can we tax the digital giants? If I, sorry, I'm speaking Portuguese of Portugal, but if I tell you now that I have to confess the problem was my Wi-Fi was not good, or serious is like everybody else waiting for the answer of the OECD. My presentation, let's see. It's focused on the pilot tool of OECD. And uh, I would like to start OECD's Global Initiative. It's a tax that is international. Here we have four rules. Two of them are applied, as you see, residence, and the other one, source state. So, uh, under task payment rules and subject to source. So they are on the screen, that are the subjects that I will present. And so let's consider the income inclusion rule. The multinational companies have to present and withhold taxation at source. So residence state. In so in this case, they have to pay tax there. So it can be a good measure. Concerning base erosion, it considers jurisdictions where the rate is on income with almost zero. So the objective in this case, these cases, as they are presented by OECD and having in account that the documents, the blueprints, uh, there are some problems. Let's see. Concerning the taxed income and uh, revenue. So the rules that are applied, so tax regulation, which are applied to the third company. So let's see in the tax law, what's the rule, what is clear? The profit of that multinational company will be taxed in a way that was already practiced. So, However, we have to consider that there is no uniformization in the taxation rules. Uh, so many companies apply to your hands. And uh, in the United States does it differently. We have Canada, Japan, and, and China, and South Korea that are different. What's profit? In fact, why is it considered differently? Uh, these differences are not so significant. I have some doubts. Well, when we have a doubt, we go to Google and ask. In this case, 
What have I done? CD, tell me the network, the rules, US CAP and US R are identical. Do they coincide? So keep in G, 545 different pages. The, the forms do not coincide and they don't include blue tweets. Does it take us to another forum to understand what's more favorable? So, Tá, então. Ok. So, it's very important if it, it's a measure that's considered low rate, some multinational companies do not invest in certain countries because they would have to burden the tax, the rate of compensation imposed when the companies that they would pay the local rate they will have to have uh, the they will be an advantage so regarding the if the rate was too high so interested to say regarding taxes therefore considering the number the numbers the tax direct taxes and only direct taxes. So a multinational, we would have a company, we will fight direct companies for multinational companies. The leaked document, they say that we exclude taxes, services, digital taxes, services, I'm sure. They would not include or cover digital services taxes. It would lead to a double punishment. Think that in a certain country when specific MNE is subject to a rate quite lower in MAS, and it's offset with the imposition of DST. This DST will not be seen as in consideration for the parent company and this company and this partnership that it's the parent company shall have to pay the ta of taxes offset based on the inclusion rule in its country of residence. Does it make sense? So in this case, we have double taxation. Does it make sense? I will try now to see how can we solve this. So here we have the carve outs. We still don't know very much regarding the carve outs and how they can be introduced. What we know is that any option, the potential to introduction of distortions is huge. In addition to the problems related to the design, there are several other deficiencies. So we are having some technical problems. I think we will move, move on. We are having problems with the connection and part was not uh, mentioned. I hope now you're hearing me. Those listening in the English, I'm reading his paper. I'm sorry, but it's the content, okay? So now we're going to talk about the carve-outs. We still don't know very much about the carve-outs, but they can be introduced. What we know regarding it, that any of this option, the potential introducing distortions is who Professor Heiner, was talking about the ring fancy and distortion of competition. This is pillar two, will lead directly to ring fencing. We have two problems regarding ring fencing. One of them, distortion and competition. First, the rules are only applied to 
partnerships to operate within transnational context that could which will be in a less favorable position than domestic companies. In second place, the rules are only applicable to MNEs with income higher than 750 million, of which they are placed in a less favorable position without the existence of a policy reason for this ring fencing. We still have a problem two problems of implementation. One, domestic law. We need still to have rules that extend tax sovereignty to globe situations, and we guarantee all changes or amendments to the law to be uniformed in order not to have double taxation. Even based on the leaked documents, it's easy to say the contours of these rules and those in, that work with law know they have to structure the wording of these domestic laws. And the second is tax treaties implementation problem. We have to have a multilateral instrument that has a clear way for all countries to effectively apply it. Do you think we could do this? We will manage to do, and then we have problems of EU law. There are several pro serious problems regarding compatibility, example, the under tax payments rules and applied only to the transnational scenario. And it violates clearly the union Right, and for example, in details, we have WTC. It was published there by me. And then what about manipulation? The rules have a minimum rate below what would should be. We could include increase direct taxes for tax payment and direct state subsides and contributions for social contribution or even with state grants. Do you think this is a possibility still to strengthen these rules with this? It's not much, but let's have the final remarks. Pillar one and two are presented by the OECD as a way to solve the problems of digital economy. Nevertheless, it makes us to go to two distinct directions. First step that the pillar one restrengthened the states as the source and the market. And pillar two will end by strengthening the states of residence, residency and the jurisdiction of export or capital export. Will, will it make sense to follow jointly diverse directions? And let's say partial annulment of tax sovereignty. With pillar two, there's a part of tax sovereignty that ends by disappearing and the implementation of the states are free to design their tax systems and concede grant subsides. Only the measure in which they are always beyond or higher than the minimum rate, except of what the OECD considers as carved out. Does it make sense the approach of the paternalist approach, I'm sorry, to remove the state's important share? And the last thing, who are the winners and those who lose? Do you need any tax reform? We have winners and losers. In the recent study by the University of Oxford, it identifies the following losers. And it's not a surprise, Bermudes, Holland, Cayman Islands, Virgin British Islands, Luxembourg, Puerto Rico, and Singapore. No surprise here. But unfortunately, it's not surprising to know who will be probably the winners of this formula in the pillar two, and would be China, and USA. Do you think we need a new world reform that have a result, the strengthening of tax revenues of world potential 
countries. Thank you very much. I'm open for the Q&A. Thank you very much. Professor João, thank you very much. I'm sure that after this panel on the internet, Siri will have more answers regarding not to have any time constraint. So now Professor Alison Christian of the University of Mathieu of Canada. She's taking the floor, Professor Alison Christian, Mathieu University, Canada. Thank you so much. It's great to be Muito on obrigado. this panel. É ótimo I'm estar hearing Portuguese aqui. coming out, so just a second while I sort that out. Muito <laughs> Sorry. I'm not sure how to change that. I have to stop sharing for a second so I can switch that off. Okay, sorry. Little unexpected gift of hearing myself uh, spoken back to me in Portuguese. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's great to be on this panel. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I uh, follow two very interesting discussions, and uh, so we'll try to uh, incorporate some of those comments into what I'll present today. So I'll start with the idea that we are working with a lot of different options right now. And if you know all of the acronyms on my uh, picture here, then you get an A in tax class because there's so much uh, going on that I, I'm actually not sure how anyone can keep track of all of it. But I will say this, uh, if you look at all of the options that are on the table, the only one that seems viable right now even has a chance of multilateral Federalism right now after the recent announcement that pillar one is probably not going to go forward. The only one that still seems viable as possible multilateral move is that one on the top left, the globe. The, and that's because it's connected to the US guilty. But why is that? Well, it's because all the rest of those options are moving income into source countries. And as my uh, colleague said in the prior presentation, you know, that's not in the interest of the big exporters of digital services, the digital giants, uh, which is the US and, and China. So the US is really uh, a key player in multilateralism and has no interest in moving base into source countries. So all of these different things that we see uh, that are sort of cropping up in the world are not going to be an easy, um, it's not going to be easy to get the US to agree to that. But, you know, these are all measures that some of them are already in place. Some of them can be done unilaterally and there is no real unilateralism so long as there's a treaty network and so long as there's coordination through domestic laws of other countries that credit or exempt uh, in, in case of income taxes. So, you know, we have to keep those, uh, those things in mind. So amongst the options, you'll see one of them uh, is, the is one that I, if you get, if you know that acronym, then you're really on the ball. It's the GEPT on the bottom right. Uh, and what is that? Well, that's my pillar three. So it's the uh, global excess profits tax idea. So here was the idea. It was really uh, thinking, okay, well, how do you work with the tools you have? And when COVID-19, uh, you know, hit the world and caused all of us to have to do these webinars online, uh, amongst other things that happened, uh, it, re uh, it rekindled a discussion that taxing digital giants is just today's modern um, equivalent of companies that uh, really benefited from the broken economy of wartime and depression economies. And then in those days, you would often see an excess profits tax because it's politically palatable and it makes sense. It's economically makes sense to tax economic rent, pure economic rent. So uh, my colleague Tarcisio Maileas, who is Portuguese and he uh, uh, has also presented on this in Portuguese. Uh, so maybe there's some thing on the internet that you can go and watch and get maybe a better uh, view from his perspective. But uh, we worked this out that if we use the tools that we have, we can 
we already have global consolidation of profit using CBCR. If you connect that to the routine, non-routine profit split that's going on with pillar one, you can already isolate that most of the non-routine profit uh, is really something that we could focus on. And it's not that hard from there to build in an additional surtax really. Once you're already doing it, it's just to take a little bit of that non-routine profit, which is exactly what the OECD is already contemplating and sort of laying out the, the structure of that, the conceptual structure of that. And if you do that, then you have the makings of a global excess profits tax. And then the question is, well, how on earth would you enforce that? And I think our answer to that is, well, then you go into globe, you look at a, a pillar two, you don't look at pillar two as a um, backstop tax now though. This time you look at pillar two as a way that you could agree on that surtax rate and and assign this cascading tax right thing. That is where if one country doesn't want to impose that tax, then the next one up the chain can do it. And that structure is built into pillar two. So effectively, we just took those elements that we had and sort of like a DJ with some records, we just remixed it and turned it into a global excess profits tax. Now you might say, I don't know, is this, you know, what, what are the pros and cons of this? Like this doesn't seem, you know, too possible possible is to make on, on a global scale. Well, the pros are the biggest pro of an excess profits tax is that it's safe in terms of economic competition. You will not drive away investment by taxing economic rent. That's just an economic sort of truth in the universe, right? So it's safe. You're not going to lose investors just because uh, you're taxing economic rent. And then the second pro is that it builds on these existing data sources. So you're not starting from scratch. You're not trying to build something new. What you do with that CBCR data is you work out which companies are already now uh, making a lot more profit than they did last year. So we just have enough data with those CBCR that we could start making that assessment. And then my third pro is that it would build on and enhance pillars one and two by kind of connecting them a little bit more ex explicitly. Sometimes I think when we think about pillar one and pillar two, we act as if they're two separate regimes, but really they actually do inform each other. They do talk to each other. So those are the pros. Now, what are the, what are the cons? Well, it depends on pillars one and two. And as I said at the beginning of this talk, pillar one is probably already dead. So, uh, you know, we need consensus to get that pillar one. And the, I think the one of the conceptual, the conceptually interesting things about pillar one is that it expanded our idea uh, that we could actually tackle this idea of, of splitting income into routine and non-routine profits. So, uh, you know, with, if we lose pillar one, do we lose that conversation? Maybe not. Maybe we still have that conversation. So, but it, for anything like a global excess profits tax that's built on pillar one and pillar two, if one of the pillars topples, then it seems like a domino effect. The other pillars will probably topple too. But even if they weren't toppling, there's just a timeline. Uh, excess profits tax is something you need in six months. You need it now. You can't wait five years for the consensus to build and then the, you know, the kinks to be worked out and then the money starts coming in. And then another con is that it requires robust CBCR. And I think I've heard a lot of people tell me that there isn't robust CBCR. Some countries are getting uh, reports from multinationals from other countries, and some are not. Uh, and maybe the information is not quite the same across countries. And then the final problem is that there's no change until there's consensus. Like that is, we're just waiting. Uh, we can't do anything until there's consensus. And that's kind of a problem with the pillar one, pillar two idea anyway. Any kind of multilateralism that considers itself not functional until everyone agrees, that is that it all has to be worked out ex ante, gives us this problem that in the meantime, we have the pro the the uh, system that we have now, and we are not making any progress. So, you know, I go from here to just say, but, you know, multilateral consensus is not only confined to ex ante agreement. You don't always have to rely on, we wait until we have multilateral consensus and then we change things. Sometimes you can develop consensus by unilateral adaptation. So long as that unilateral adaptation works within existing frameworks. Now I have on the next slide, it's a complicated big mess. Uh, there's a lot going on here and I'm not gonna spend uh, hours and hours on this slide 
slide because I think that my fellow panelists will tell me I have maybe two minutes to tell you about this slide. So uh, I will just say that the idea of this slide is just to demonstrate that there are ways to think about uh, unilateral measures that really aren't unilateral if you think how they work in uh, in terms of the system that we have. So if you look in the top uh, left, you see a purple and blue box. And I say, well, what are the things we're trying to tax in this digital economy conversation? Well, there are these different, these four different things. The size of the boxes is roughly in my mind somehow connected to the size of the problem or the size of the missing tax base, but it's not scientific, it's just an idea. So you see the blue box e-commerce and I think maybe we put that to the side. We say we don't worry about that too much because maybe a VAT picks it up. But those other ones, those are the ones we're trying to grab. Advertising, online services, user data sales. And what I'm suggesting is, okay, let's say you go the unilateral route. You add a provision uh, to apply a withholding tax uh, on non-residents alongside other existing withholding taxes. Then you can go through a treaty analysis and a non-treaty analysis. And I won't do that now because my time is over, but the, you can take a look at the slide and I'm always available to uh, you know, talk about this. And I have a paper coming out, which I have on this slide. So you can read here the GEP tax, the Global Excess Province Tax Proposal. I have a little bit more detail and a longer uh, piece. I have a tax notes interview that you can listen to. There's a withholding tax explanation in the more recent paper. And of course, contact me and on Twitter, uh, Instagram, and so on. Okay, fine. But maybe on Twitter, we have a conversation and I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be with you today. Professor Alistair, thank you. Congratulations. Uh, Professor Rodrigo uh, é mestre, doutor pela USP, é diretor e professor do... Vai a USP, director and, prof and professor of IBDT. Now he's taking the floor, Professor Rodrigo Maito da Silveira. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure being here, sharing this table with so honored and expert professors, mainly concerning digital economy, taxation on the digital economy. Can you see my slides properly? Yes. So let's carry on. So now presentation mode. Now, yes. So thank you. I will try to be brief due to time constraint, the context I have, which as we've seen via the other presentations, there are many questions concerning taxation focused on the fair share of each country, what each country could consider taxed in a fair way, an adequate way, covering all the intentions of the countries. The fact is that in this context, we have many controversies and consensus is far from being obtained. The idea is bringing the Brazilian perspective. If the way Brazil is dealing with taxation, can it be, can it bring some idea in what can be, could be used internationally speaking, something to be followed. Brazil, since the 40s of last century, we have tax withheld at source of the non-residents. When we talk about digital economy, basically we have two income items that are taxed directly. 
yes, of services and royalties. It depends on the way it's qualified, the situation is qualified, because we are talking about digital economy, mainly taxation concerning intangibles. Of course, capital gain can be, can be considered as something to be taxed depending on the alienation of the intangibles, not merely rendering services. The fact is that Brazil along the time has improved its concept concerning what are considered services. The concept of service, uh, there are many controversies, mainly when it refers to technical services. The revenue on year 14 of the century decided to end the discussions via Rule 455, saying that technical services would be considered any kind of service that uh, involves expertise on some technical knowledge and also uh, administrative assistance and consultancy being automated. So what's the scenario nowadays concerning uh, taxation withheld at source? The reality in Brazil, technical service, is taxed on 15%, we have contributions, seed, peas and coffins, which are taxes when it refers to payment to non-residents. And also I assess uh, that, that the tax on services and on financial operations that IOF due to exchange situations, exchange rates for that, taxes can uh, reach 45%, uh, nominally speaking, there is a segregation. Though the technical services and pure services are separate. I really don't understand what's non-technical and what's pure, because for me, service, it involves knowledge to do. On the other hand, the pure services are not subject to CG tax. Is at source, the rate is higher than the technical services. And naturally, taxing is, in the end, the same nominal rate globally. So that's the same result. And so on, the royalties are subject to lower tax at source, but there are many controversies about the deductibility of the royalties are not entered due to time constraint. In Brazil, the time we're seeing now, we have a framework in terms of legislation. We have several taxes that are on imports of services or royalties when you pay the non-residents it's considered that. Uh, so uh, a digital services tax necessity, it does not make any sense questioning it. We do have taxation that is no doubt already very high in terms of payments of royalties. And concerning intangibles that come from digital economy, so the burden is high. Uh, so this burden is present due to these taxes. So the, there is a discussion about uh, a point. C2C, B2B, in fact, in practical terms, is it materialized taxation? Because when a person, an individual acquires intangibles via internet, not necessarily uh, the mechanisms 
effective mechanisms are present to know if that individual is paying all the taxes differently from what happens to revenue contribution and the other taxes fiscal fees ISCS the other tax the individual internationally speaking has to pay is immediately okay what the others uh, taxes are also paid but the IOF is another tax that has to pay, be paid so it is a challenge in practical terms because we have to check if all the obligations concerning taxation are being fulfilled in this treaty Brazil is acknowledged in Brazil in the international scenario uh, with a very singular position concerning payment of this kind of service. Brazil, along the time, always looked for or tried to cover to itself the right to withhold a source, even if historically these remunerations should be subject to Article 7, so profit of companies that can be withheld at the resident, not at source, but most of the Brazilian treaties and protocols brings a, a, kind, a kind of a qualification to compare technical assistance to royalties, i.e. to use the Brazilian treaties except those of Austria, Finland, and Japan and Sweden, there would be then in any, every case of remuneration, the non-residents referring to services and uh, equivalent to royalties. So there is a displacement of the rule from Article 7 to Article 12. And the revenue, inland revenue, due to precedence in terms of uh, case law in the line that the qualification should respect the treaty has or not a rule, specific rule for this taxation. In fact, in 2014, it has been presented, the interpretation with the reporter saying that uh, Taxation refers to 12 royalties if there is a protocol. Obviously, the Article 14 concerning remuneration of independent professionals. This article has been excluded from OECD convention model. Uh, and on the scope of the seventh article or 12th, depending on the situation, the nature of the service rendered. And uh, procedurally, the treaties, if they don't have in that protocol the equivalency, so you use the seventh article. That's a situation that we are facing in Brazil now. Obviously, there are uh, several attenuations concerning these equivalencies when it refers to capital gains. Brazil also. The taxation at source, it's based on the criteria of localization of the assets concerning the capital gain. Uh, so if it's here located, uh, so there is uh, the, the taxation at source, regardless where the sellers or uh, where the, the taxpayer that is just doing the first of this gain is located. Uh, so. To what extent do we have a norm or regulation that permits that we reach taxation of this gain? I understand that in certain situations, exceptions, where there is simulation of vice in the structures of a business, so direct sale is not reached by taxation, Brazilian taxation, because any rearrangement in the society, in the company abroad, where the, there is a participation, uh, uh, company participation, when we have sub companies, uh, it's like having a participation, a share participation, a partnership. Uh, so 
there is a vast debate about it the if it's applicable or not in this case with holding at source we can also mention a certain progress referring to the discussion of BEPS action in Pillars 1 and 2. The, the discussion looks for solutions that we can tax the digital economy, and in parallel, we have a progress in the discussion about uh, withholding at source. In 2017, in Rio de Janeiro, we have several panels uh, dealing with concepts of what could be covered by this umbrella of services, services rendered. In CO in 2018, we had a discussion, the topic that was the main one in the forum there about the different uh, forms of withholding at source in different countries. It was very enriching and we checked that not every country uh, do the withholding at source using the same criteria. Is it possible to look for uh, withholding at source with the net profit, not the gross one, as we have here in Brazil? In 2019, the subject was already mentioned, was also mentioned uh, due to uh, universal uh, this stage, taxation, sorry, concerning allocation of taxing rights. And so what are we seeing here? The right to tax source versus residence. So it's not a new problem. It's an old problem revisited. It has all its existing discussions. How do we allocate that? This initiative is valid, I understand, yes, in the context that we're looking for taxation, uh, state as income, that situations where the, not even the source and resident countries can do the taxation so well. Uh, so in practical terms concerning how the solution is being considered or discussed in pillar, in pillar one and two, it, Will that be accepted by countries with so many different realities concerning taxation and very complex problems with very peculiar characteristics and particular characteristics? My point of view concerning this theme is that this initiative of the OECD, basically, it will end with a rediscussion of allocation of the power to tax going beyond the digital economy. So we are talking about measures that can affect the traditional economy. And as Professor Croft has mentioned today in this morning. So I wrap up my presentation saying that uh, this dichotomy between allocation of power to withhold that source of residence. It will carry on existing because the model we have in Brazil, is it the best solution for this problem? Particularly, I understand not the way it is being implemented. And it was implemented here, let us say, against the will of, because we do not have a, a vanguard position. It was by accident, uh, so in a certain sense. And in this aspect, what I maintain as a position is that taxation not serves practical terms, it works, but it has to be gorged in order to have a balance in, in terms of burden, and what each country can have in collection terms. It seems that in line with what is always said, there is a sentence of an American journalist that says that to every complex problem, there is always a solution that is simple clear, but equally sometimes doubtful. So I prefer to count on a different view. Someone 
that is a visionary and was a visionary simplicity is the supreme sophistication. The intention here of this action is legitimate. So solutions are complex. They are sometimes utopia. And with holding at source, yes, there are problems with that, but can it be improved and can we show an adequate solution to deal not only with the digital economy, but also with this uh, intentions to do the withholding at source, which are shown as initiatives that are considered in treaties like the one that is inserted in the UN uh, model convention. So the solution goes via several discussions in order to know if it is really the best solution among the others presented. Thank you very much. Rodrigo, thank you very much. Now we will place the answer of the quiz concerning the second question. And we will then pass the floor to Renata. You know, the Renata can do questions in this uh, debate round. Good morning, everyone. As we noted with our lectures, there is there are controversies concerning the proposal of OECD in Pillars 1 and 2, mainly what refers to the big difficulty to implement what's proposed there, issues regarding the complexity of this proposal and the eventual double taxation that may be caused in the absence of a consensus among the countries, members of OECD. Of course, it's the efficiency of the measures. On the other hand, Professor Allison is proposing here in Pillar 3, so something inedit, new, and uh, we think that we will face the same difficulties of the two other pillars, two other proposals. Due to that, what we see in practice is that adopting measures that are unilateral is a digital service tax via which these countries intend to tax profits of economy of digital economy. Due to that, I ask you, lecturers, what are the pros and cons of this unilateral approach that's being done by the countries? Professor Prakas, first. Thank you for giving me a chance to say something on that. Uh, I think we have to differ. Uh, it depends very much how such a digital service tax would look like. Um, I would be very against such a tax if it is, was levied in form of an income tax, also in form of a withholding tax. That doesn't make sense. Uh, we would always get in conflict with treaties. We would have the same problem that we get, that we need some kind of harmonization. Uh, worldwide, we need treaty rules which uh, which avoid double taxation. Otherwise, the double taxation will be uh, substantial, and that will be a, a a serious obstacle for international trade. And it makes the countries which are more aggressive here in this respect less attractive for foreign investments. I think that is always something we should have in mind. And there will be at the end some kind of competition between states. Uh, and I don't think that this will be uh, in favor of international trade. But I would be in favor for a, such a tax if it was levied in form of an excise tax. Uh, the proposal of the European Union seems to me um, quite okay, I think we can live with such a tax. It is an additional income for market jurisdiction, what they want to have at the end. Uh, it will, at least in the EU, it would be harmonized. And I think uh, other states would be invited to, to uh, adopt the same directive. 
And it would be a clear answer also on America first. Uh, I would say it is an answer. It would be an answer of the state community uh, no, uh, on the behavior of somebody like Trump and uh, gives a clear answer you know, how the US companies which are doing business here without paying taxes, how they should be treated. Thanks. Professor João. Muito obrigado. Os, os prós de qualquer solução pros unilateral. Of any unilateral solution are well, well defined. It's a way to obtain income fast. Therefore, it's easy without worldwide consensus for the revenue. On the other side, it should not be underestimated as a political weapon. It needs a worldwide consensus, and this can be made through the adoption of a solution that's unilateral, such as a tax or digital service tax. Nevertheless, the problem seems, seem, let's say, the inconvenience are more than the advantages. Now we are heading towards a globalization multilateralization and unilateral solutions prevent this is going backwards we should go against the the path we are adopting up to now and consensus we will have worldwide problems without a consensus if we have compliance problems because it's not harmonized it leads to double taxation and how these taxes and unilateral reactions have an effect of the ring fences. So, so it's applied to some companies, services, and therefore, so this could be the outcome of threshold 150 million or to apply to some products that digital products compete with normal, ordinary pro products. And, unilateral solution of turnover taxes and all the problems regarding turnover taxes, which is a way less developed of taxes over income because it will tax all with or without capacity to pay taxes. A company, let's say a startup that's starting in the market, even if it does not have income, which is normal for a startup, we'll have to pay. Uh, last point, if you allow me, I know we have constraints on time. Many countries are concerned with tax levels of those companies that are located there, paying less taxes than those that are comparable to it and non-digital. And they're thinking about pillar one or two or different solutions. Nevertheless, we still did not see any of these states dealing with a problem that's Manang University, uh, UZW Manang, sign one of the causes of low taxation of digital economy, which are the incentives that the states per se grant to these companies, like the patent boxes, like an example, Depreci speed up the, the depreciation, amortization, specific things for these e digital economy companies. I think the, those, the states should be capable of changing rules in a way that's the one like pillar one of two or even imposing rules like dst if they were not company that in-house solving their own tax incentives that lead to these distortions thank you very much for your attention and i hope, hope to contribute during the chat Alison, please you take the floor now Thank you so much. Um, so let me make a pitch in favor of unilateralism and also in favor of not using that term. 
So we know there is no such thing as a fully isolated movement. You can't do anything in tax without thinking about how it has international impact. So any move you make, you're not working in a vacuum, you're working with a bunch of rules you already have. So if, there, if you don't have a treaty network, then what you're working with is the foreign tax credit or exemption rules of other countries. So of course a digital service tax is not going to be great if you're not going to get a credit or exemption in the other country, which is why if you don't have treaties, you shouldn't be using digital services taxes, you should be using withholding taxes in your income tax, which have more chance of being creditable. So that's a, when we say unilateral, we are su suggesting that unilateral is autonomous or isolated, and I would argue the opposite is true, it's not isolated. But then to further that point, you should I think unilateralism can push the conversation forward. So consider when Europe, when France decided to do the DST, the U.S. respond not with the multilateral institutions. It had already dismantled those in multilateral institutions in the form of the dispute settlement understanding in the WTO. The U.S. had already eliminated multilateralism, and so they used an internal decision-making process to decide for them themselves, not that France's tax had violated the GATT or the GATS, but that it, it, in, that it, it had violated US, U.S. view of what is uh, fair, reasonable, or discriminatory against itself. And it came out with a unilateral decision that France's DST violated its own internal idea of what is fair for trade, not using GATT, not using GATS. So that's a movement. Now, the US might have used that 301 to try to convince other countries not to go down that road, that it was willing to bypass multilateralism to punish a state using its own internal rules. That is the definition of unilateral. Right. So I would argue that that message didn't quite go through because then we have a whole lot of other countries adopting DSTs. And now the U.S. has initiated a second 301 investigation, not a multilateral, not using GATT, not using GATS, not using its dispute resolution. They're using their internal decision making process to decide it's discriminatory. That is not unilateral. So I, or sorry, that is not multilateral. But what it does is it gives a message. So what we, I think, if you want harmonized rules, you have to understand that you're not working with a country that's willing to work through multilateralism. So therefore, you have to go to where that country already is. And where are they? They have a very complicated, very sophisticated foreign tax credit regime, which credits in lieu of taxes. And even in the Pillar 2, someone leaked those documents. Uh, even in the Pillar 2 document, we can see the admission that uh, in lieu of taxes are income taxes until a court in the U.S. decides that's not creditable, then a withholding tax on digital services, advertising services would be creditable under the normal rules. No double tax and forget about dispute resolution. Why do we think the U.S. is going to agree to dispute resolution in tax when they've spent the last years dismantling it in trade? And that's my two cents on that. Thank you. Obrigada, professora Alison Rodrigo. Seus... Obrigado, Alison now Rodrigo. Thank you very much, Renata. I have, I don't have much to add after the talks of my peers here in this panel. In fact, what I understand is that these unilateral this initiatives pose some problems that I think it complicates furthermore the scenario. Difficulties to enforce treaty against the ultra taxation, collection, discriminatory aspects that are very serious. And by the end of the day, if the idea is to tax income that's not collected due to digital economy, these initiatives that are unilateral, they represent, in fact, a bypass regarding the system that has always was in force, i.e. this debate is such of curious because historically countries that export capital they always try to collect taxes based on residence and this shift of the scenario of economy leads to this debate it seems to me that 
DST, Digital Service Tax, has problems that even worse than double taxation withheld at source by the income tax. If this tax at source, the way it is conceived in many countries that it tax gross income, not net income like we have in Brazil, the ST goes beyond because it's a tax with a different nature. It ends by converting over consumption tax and it trends to tax gross income, not net incomes, bringing some questions pegged to it. I will now make use of the question that was placed in the chat, which is something we did not cover in this panel, but it's regarding tax withheld at source. The question regarding marketing services that use the multinational group, but not directly remunerated by a country, how to tax this adding of value without formal source of payment to justify the tax imposition. I would say this problem has always existed on traditional economies, not just because now how digitalization of economy that we will start to tax certain service that always existed. Well, this debate on how to allocate the tax authority for this adding of value, it's very complicated because by the end of the day, we have to need uh, have a nexus to justify the taxes, otherwise we will come back to the highly complex solutions and difficult consensus. That it, what each country can do, all the points addressed here, pillar one, two, by the end of the day, we always have the debate regarding a percentage or fixed margin that must be set forth in order to define what each country can tax. If there is a certain arbitrarity here, not on the bad sense, but let's say it is necessary to arbitrate this thing to allocate the tax for authority be amongst countries. If this is a problem in the solutions that are being addressed by pillars one and two, likewise, we would have to search for solving this issue of adding values in a country that has no elements of connection to justify the taxation. We would have also to start to find solutions in this line of assumptions to allow some level of taxation. So this is highly complex question. I don't have a straightforward answer, but that could solve the problem. But I would say that this is not a point exclusive of taxation of digital economy, but it's something permeating the economy as a whole and the traditional economy. Thank you very much. Professor Rodrigo, so I would like to say some things to conclude this panel. I think the major question when we talk about the digital economy is that currently the big value of these companies is created by the own users, like a recent documentary by Social Dynama by Netflix, it places in an emblematic way. If you're not paying, it's because you are the product. And we are the product within the digital economy. This is the big value that's being traded by Google, Facebook, and other companies that work in this market. And then I think we have this question placed in this panel. When I have a company like in Germany that's acquiring data of users of the market of Brazil, and then it seems to me a profit that we will not be able to capture, we will not be able to tax with a source system we have or IOF on the credit card on financial transactions because it's not payment by someone living in Brazil resident. But the biggest profit that it's been generated, it 
comes from the negotiation of data of these Brazilian users. And then we have a proposal by Pillar 1 to allocate part of these profits that it was generated here in the country in this market in order that they can also be taxed by Brazil. As we saw, there are, in fact, several challenges to implement pillars one and two, and of course, challenges that we verify were not overcome yet. Lack of consensus amongst countries, and the other side, a strong position by USA, uh, well placed by Professor Allison, challenging the feasibility of this proposal. But it's a proposal by, on the other hand, at least amongst those we examined up to date, perhaps the only one that can capture this sort of scenario. So it deserves, yes, a reflection and perhaps to be improved in order that some of these problems can be overcome. Perhaps it's the basis for us to develop to a new solution, but that would bring more fairness in the taxation of digital economy. I think these were the comments I wanted to place in this panel. Final remarks and Alessandra, pass the floor to you. Before Alexander, before you wrap up, I would like to place a final comment. We have time not with the merit of what each one of us has addressed, but I believe I am the last of the organizers with participation in the panels. And I would like to use this time to thank all the panelists that dedicated their time, the precious time they have to contribute in a cool way and with all the applauses they deserve, all that share their time with us today, and will participate of the next panels to present their ideas. I thank IBDT, USP University, the translators, everyone that has contributed for this event to reach the success. It has reached in all editions. And this year, we are, we believe we will be able to fulfill our objective. Thank you all. And it was a huge pleasure to debate these complex questions with all of you. Thank you very much. Therefore, I would like to wrap up this panel saying that it was truly a pleasure to be here. Our panel was so profitable with rich debate and this is only possible according to what Rodrigo mentioned because we have an involvement we held many meetings we dedicated for this moment for truly happened in the best way possible and I believe this is the merit of the IBDT throughout its existence its life from Professor Luis Gomes de Souza is trying to uh, have excellence on tax law studies, and I joke that it's it's a brand, a quality brand, IBDT. I'm honored to be part of this. It's a special invitation by an institution that has always praised and worked on the quality of, of its studies, professionally wise, the academia, but to have a commitment with creating a tax law fair, debatable and debated and that respects and abide by all. Thank you very much with these words, you all, IBDT, the panelists, thank you very much for this effort. And during this pandemic times, we are in, on time and we had the debate of very, very high level and quality. 